It's really good to see you all here in person and all of you on Zoom too. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to introduce Tuari Salah to you all. Some of you uh, were at the BIPOC retreat, Common Ground's first annual teacher-led BIPOC retreat at the retreat center. And I hear that it was a wonderful week. So Tuari is out there. Every, it's a lot of happiness when I picked Tuari up today and Stacy and heard from some of the other folks out there. But grateful too that Tuari was willing to stay on uh, for a couple more days to do a little teaching here at the city center, starting with tonight, a public talk here, and then a day-long retreat tomorrow. And there's still space for that. If you'd like to register, uh, just please go to the calendar so we have a, a good count of who's coming. From the day I met Tawari, I loved her. <laughs> I'll just start with that. In 2017, during our teacher training at Insight Meditation Society, and we've been good friends ever since. Uh, Tawari is a guiding teacher at Seattle Insight and a guiding teacher at Spirit Rock Meditation Center. She teaches everywhere, often. <laughs> She's got this long history in uh, social justice work and as a prosecuting attorney, uh, we were just talking about her 25 years of service as an attorney and um, how that aligned with her values and what she learned from that work and how it's given her the energy to have a pretty intense Dharma teaching schedule without much challenge to her physically or mentally, which is always impressive to me. As you'll see, um, there's so many things to appreciate about her, including her easy, just how easy it is to be around her, her ease of laughter and accessing wholesome states like joy and kindness and how that just seems to flow in her life and in her teaching so naturally, including her deep love of the Dhamma and her love for the depth of the Dhamma. So I'm sure you will see some of, uh, hear a little bit of everything and hopefully it inspires you to continue your own practice in meaningful ways too. So for now, I'm so happy to have uh, spent some time with you at my home in Minneapolis and now to host you at Common Ground. Love you and have a good talk. <laughs> yes, uh, this is, I think it's on, right? Can you hear it this way? Yeah, Shelly and I are definitely twins. Somehow our parents figured out a way to have us as twins in separate households but i don't know how that worked out but we are twins <laughs> uh, very close so um i decided to talk about something completely different than what i talked about on the retreat and uh it makes for interesting thinking um, to come in a completely different environment and talk about something completely different. But uh, I want to talk about the three characteristics tonight, and I want to talk about it, I think, in my own unique kind of way. Um, how many of you were here the last time I came? Oh, wow. Well, this is really going to be great. I could have talked about that. <laughs> well, because you would know. <laughs> this is great. So then how many of you are used to my teaching in general? Maybe online I could just see some hands go up. Oh, yes. this gonna, We're going to have a great time then. This is going to really be good. So um, I'm very energetic. I'm a different kind of a teacher because I am an extrovert. And most teachers are very introverted and I'm very outward, big, 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 big. And so the Dhamma comes across very big with me and I love it. It took a long time to be a teacher who had such a big energy and be okay with it. But I do have a big energy and I think big energy is great for community Dhammas because you could come from work, we come from doing all this stuff all day. And so coming and doing Dhamma needs to be something that uh, comes from a big energy. So I'm going to start with a poem. Um, of all the poems I've been looking at, I didn't know this was the one I was going to start with, but I finally realized it sitting here. And, um, and then we will have a sit and then I'll 
talk a little bit about the three characteristics, and then we'll take some questions. So this poem is called Smart Cookie by Richard uh, Schiffman. He says, the fortune that you seek is in another cookie. That was my fortune. So I'll be equally frank. The wisdom that you covet is in another poem. The life that you desire is in a different universe. The cookie you are craving is in another jar, and the jar is buried somewhere in Tennessee. Don't even think of searching for it. If you found that jar, everything would go kaflui for a thousand miles around. It is the jar of your fate in an alternative reality. Don't even think of living that life. Don't even think of eating that cookie. Be a smart cookie. Eat what's on your plate, not in some jar in Tennessee. That's my wisdom for today. Though I know it's not what you were looking for. <laughs> That's cute. So I'll give a little bit of instructions to help us all settle together. And then we'll um, talk a little bit about the Dhamma. And just start with just arriving here with noticing the sounds. Noticing the sounds for those of you online. And get a sense that all of us in the room, in our various homes, places, we are all attuning to sound. And even though we don't hear necessarily the same sounds, we all can hear the silence underneath that sound. So just attuning your ear to the silence that's present for all of us, no matter where we are. And then maybe noticing how sound moves. It shifts and changes. It pushes against the silence. It doesn't really matter if thinking arises while we sit here. That is just part of our sensory experience. But we could always return to this arising moment of silence and the sounds that's in the backdrop of it. Maybe you could feel the body sitting here. If you're at home lying down, you can feel the body lying down. But this body and the sensory experience of the body's posture also, always here. You could feel the weight and its heaviness on the underside of the legs or the back of the arms. You can feel the weight of it pulling you down into the ground, into the earth. It's actually anchoring you here in this moment. So even if the mind starts talking or thinking, you could always return to the felt sense of the body and its posture right here, right now.
to feel the hardness of the bones in your body. It doesn't matter, soft tissue, flesh, you can still feel hard, hard bones in the feet, the hardness of bone in the leg, even though they may not even be touching anything. Sit bones, bones in the back, shoulders, arms, the neck, the head. You can feel all this bone. Get a sense of the earth quality of this body and its steadiness, stillness, like a mountain. No matter how far the mind goes in thinking, we could always return to this felt sense of the body's weight, hardness, the sensory uh, experience of the body's posture right here, right now. You don't have to do anything. It's just always available. And for some of you, you can get into that stillness, to the place where you feel the body breathing. Not something you have to control either. It's always breathing. And you can just turn your attention towards the felt sense of this breath. The mind may wander, get caught into some thinking about something, but at some point you will notice your thinking and you can find your way back to the sounds, the silence, the posture, or the body breathing. And the gift of Dhamma is the present moment. So in this moment, we just begin again.
a poem by Judy Soram Brown. There is a trough in waves, a low spot where horizon disappears and only sky and water are our company. And there we lose our way. Unless we rest, knowing the wave will bring us to its crest again, there we may drown. If we let fear hold us within its grips and shake us side to side and leave us flailing, torn, disoriented, Let me read that again. There is a trough in waves, a low spot where horizon disappears, and only sky and water are our company. And there we lose our way. Unless we rest, knowing the wave will bring us to its crest again, there we may drown. If we let fear hold us within its grip and shake us side to side and leave us flailing, torn, disoriented. But if we rest there in the trough, our silent being with the low part of the way, keeping our energy and noticing the shape of things, the flow, then time alone will bring us to another place where we can see horizon, see the land again, regain our sense of where we are and where we need to swim. I realized when I was sitting here that actually I'm going to talk about suffering, which is the same thing I talked about all weekend, but that's okay. We're in the low part. We're in a low part in this world. It is a mess. There's no doubt about it. I think it's mostly a mess because we're actually paying attention to it, but if we think back, if we remember, I don't know a time when it hasn't been a mess in the world. So this world that we think of as being so messy is really called samsara. And samsara is described as this cycle of continuity, this world of suffering or the world of delusion. It's this constantly being subjected to conditioning. Conditions coming together, falling apart. It's also described as the shadow to Nibbana. You could think of it as the trough, the low part in a way that's very much a part of the way. So the thing about samsara is it's all around us. We live in it. Every single one of us lives in it. And yet it's not really visible to us in that way. It's the low part of a wave that is inherent in the wave, and yet we get caught in the fear of the whole thing, the panic of being in this low part, and it can destroy us when we get caught in it. And the the big dilemma to 
samsara, like in the trough, is if you don't realize you're in the low part of the way. And if you don't realize that, you can get caught. And rather than rest, you begin to fight with the water. And you can drown. And so in a way, we are in a low part in the way. And I want to talk about how the low part of the wave exists and this high part, when the wave actually brings us to the crest again. So the way the Buddha described this world of samsara, he described it in the three characteristics and he described it as the suffering associated with change. So the constant change that's all around us carries with it a certain degree of suffering. He described it as there was this suffering that associated with the fact that we live in a conditioned world, that things come together and fall apart, come together and we can't really depend on anything. We, we, we try to depend on in things, but we can't really depend on things. And because of that, there's the suffering. And then he described it as this association with physical and mental pain, this anguish that we live because of all of this. Um, it's another part of the suffering. The thing is, though, this suffering that he was talking about is like the trough. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to not somehow be uh, a world associated with change or a world that's associated with uh, conditionality or a world that's kind of like um, trapped in all this mental and physical pain. We're not going to live in a world that doesn't have that. And this is the dilemma that comes with a practice where you are setting your sight on a more altruistic, this, this place of kindness and care, and yet you live in a world of suffering. And so I think of this uh, world that we live in as like the continuity of suffering. And this is this world that we live in. But there is another way that we can perceive the exact same world and live in it within the context of this suffering without the anguish that comes with it. And that's what I think the three characteristics, the way the Buddha pointed to them, that's what I think they are pointing to. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can move into what I would consider this continuity of mindfulness that lives within the context of the trough of the waves, the low part, and yet it allows us to rest and to be there and let time and reality bring us to the crest. We can see our way through. So one of the main reasons I think that we live in such a suffering state when we're in this samsara is because of the nature of the way our ordinary minds are developed and trained. We've been trained this since we were infants, babies. We train our babies. It's how we move through the world, how we know where we're at. And so it's based in this kind of a closed loop system. Our entire existence exists within the framing of our nouns, the things we label. There's a this and a that, and a this and a that. And we know what it is, and we were trained that way. Bee, bird, and this is the picture of a bird. We're trained in this way to live our lives out of this framing that's set in motion from the time we're born 
our families, our neighborhood, our schools, our friends, everybody sets in motion how we are to see the world and what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. We know what it is. And that framing that is so defined, we have an egoic mind that will not let us see outside of that framing. We cannot see that we are in a framing, can see that we're in a trough, in a low part. Instead, we just look for the nouns to help us know where we're at. So this framing, this kind of um, closed loop system that we live out of, it has some rules. And one of the main rules is the ego is the guardian, chief executive officer. And it decides what comes in and what comes out, what gets kicked out. So if we see something that looks new, different, doesn't fit in the rules, this ego will kick it right on out. Just that, yes, not even going to look at that not even important. We have all this tendency to get caught up in the felt sense of discomfort when something new happens or something changes from what it expects. All this discomfort comes up and we have a certain reactivity that we're going to follow. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but I'm just setting this understanding of what we're working with. Because if something happens to look a little bit like the ego of our mind can believe it and it sneaks in, if it changes in any way and doesn't maintain our understanding, it'll be kicked out. We have this system that kicks out everything that doesn't fit within our concept of the way things ought to be. Very secular, very um, uh, self-contained. And we go through the world like this. In fact, we depend on the world like this. Every time you come into this building, you expect it to look a certain way. We don't even have to look at it anymore. I can see it because I haven't been here for a long time and I'm like, I forgot all about that little entryway where the, the floor is so different. I forgot that I was just as excited about it when I first saw it as I am this time. But we don't really notice these things. You walk right past that and don't even see it. We go home and our homes look exactly the same. We walk around our houses and we don't even look at them. We haven't even seen them. It's only if something is out of place that we begin to pay attention. And then it's usually to get it back in place quickly that everything is exactly as it should be. This is, I know where everything is. I know what it looks like. I know where I'm at. I'm solid. I'm safe. And that world is the world of samsara. It is inherently trapped in dukkha or suffering. There is no way out of it. And yet, as practitioners, we are taught over and over and over that the moment is a new. It's a new, it's a new, it's a new, it's a new. It's changing all the time. We all know impermanence. We talk about it all the time. We know conditionality. We talk about that too. We know non-self. I know anatta. It's not me. It's not mine. It's not I. And yet, Whenever any one of these three characteristics show up, it throws us off completely as if it shouldn't be that way. And so that, to me, is where our difficulty lies, is not seeing that we are in samsara. And when we sort of um, come into reality, it's going to be a little jarring. 
it's going to be a little uneasy. In fact, it should be unfamiliar to you because it's new. You've never seen it before. It should be a little unknown. Could you imagine walking in this building as if you've never been in it before? But in truth, this is the first time you've been in this building with me here in this space. And yet it feels so, we want it to feel familiar, known, but our world and the way that we could live in a more liberated way would be if we could walk around in the world as if it were new, first time, fresh, just seeing it, just now, this moment. If we could see the world that way, we would not get tripped up if something ended because it would be a new. We wouldn't get tripped up if something was not uh, about me. Some change happened. Some condition reset itself. We wouldn't get tripped up because it is a new every moment anyway. So how do we live in a world that feels safe when it feels habitually permanent and feels unsafe when it's in reality? How do you live in a world like that? It's where I think the Dhamma is about. And practicing with the three characteristics is how I think we live in a world like that. This is how I think we begin to shake up our glued sense of um, closed loop cycle. And the Dhamma, think of it as not circular at all, flowing freely like a river, never the same river ever, always flowing freely. And it does not have that circular kind of it's always got to be this way it is different every time and I want to talk about how we could begin to see life in this newer framing and we could use our sort of um, limited view or mindfulness as a way to help us see our limited view So two ways of looking, just continuity is like me in glasses. So I got to wear them. I could take them off, but the world would look very weird. And you'd have to be surprised because I might be calling you some other person's name because I wouldn't necessarily be able to see clearly who you are. And so if I look at my life look at the world through my glasses, I can forget very easily that I'm looking through glasses because I can almost don't even see them. Unless I see the rim, I don't even know I'm looking through glasses. I think I'm looking at the world the way it is, but I'm actually looking at the world through this distorted lens that's helping me see it more clearly. And if I notice the rim, then I can tell, oh, I'm looking through a distortion. In some respects, that's what we want to do. And our practice is designed to help us see the distortion that we're looking at. That's one way to think about this practice is to help you see the distortion so that you know that distortion exists. And then you can decide how you want to relate to it. But you got to first know you're looking at a distortion. Second way you could think about Dhamma and its practice is like uh, what a scarecrow does. You know, a scarecrow looks like a person. I've seen some scarecrows driving across the country. They don't look like the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz. 
I thought they were supposed to look like real people. They don't even have to look like real people. They can just be a stick up there with a thing pointed down. They look very weird. But scarecrows have a purpose. They want to convince the birds that there's a person out there. And the bird looks and sees and notices a person's out there and waiting for that person to leave. But if the bird got a little bit closer, it could begin to see that this being is not moving. It's not doing anything. It's not really real. And then I can remember driving cross country one time and noticed how the birds would begin to sit on the scarecrows. <laughs> you know, they just sit up there, they know. Now, you can't fake them. You need to get another scarecrow out there because this ain't working anymore. And in a way, mindfulness helps us get a little closer to understanding this distorted view that we're looking at. And when we get a little closer and begin to give it a good look, now it doesn't rock our world so much. Unfamiliar doesn't scare us as much. Something unknown doesn't have the kind of shakeup that it does normally. And so what we are trying to learn with this practice is how to get up close to our distortions and to see how we're actually perceiving something. So this is the way I'd like to kind of talk about the three characteristics a little bit. We're gonna talk about it more in detail tomorrow. But I call, there, there are four distortions, but I'm only gonna talk about three of them um, in relation to the three characteristics. So I call them the great distortions because they distort everything about the way we perceive the world. And these distortions show up on three levels. They show up in our thoughts, they show up in our perception, and they show up in our views. And something about this practice is kind of picking at us, poking at us, almost like this bell trying to tell us we are stuck in a distortion here. And the way we're going to know it is we have to feel the tension of that distortion between reality and um, our closed loop system. It's like when our closed loop system comes in contact with reality, it gets weird, sort of like for those of us that wear glasses, taking our glasses off. All of a sudden you're looking, it looks a little weird. So let me see if I can kind of help you see what I mean a little bit. So when we are, when we forget the reality of impermanence. We can look at things as if we're in a sleep mode, meaning we don't even notice that things are gonna end. We just park our car, and every one of you believes when you go out to your car, it's gonna start. You don't have any, there's no, there's no thought that that car, once you parked it, that's the end of it. You don't think that. We don't think in that way. We just go to sleep. So whatever, when we get a job, we think it's always going to be that way. There's like, it, it's this, this built in. And sometimes the losing of something, the ending of something, when we come face to face with the reality of that, it wakes us up. That's what it's doing. It's not 
necessarily harming us as much as it is waking us up that things in things change all the time or sometimes we go through life in this perception that we only see the things that we like and we don't see anything else so if i it's like I my I live in the inner city. I've always lived in the inner city. But sometimes it's amazing to me how a building will go down. I mean, will be completely destroyed, gotten rid of, and a new building will be put up. And I didn't even notice the the the, the destroying of the one building and the putting up of the other building. And I'll just walk by and see this monstrosity of something and how did that get there I know what happened theoretically but I I didn't see it as it was happening because we block out so much of the world that we don't see the endings and the beginnings our perception can't see it so tomorrow we're going to talk about how we can adjust our perceptions and how we can look at our thoughts to begin to see impermanence and know its connection. Another way that we don't see perception or impermanence is we begin to think that the thing is the problem. That whatever has happened, like, um, you know, you get a job and you're so happy you couldn't wait to get it. And then um, shortly thereafter, it starts, the real people start showing up and you start having this relationship with the job that's completely different than the one you thought you were going to have. It's more like you... Um, you start getting dissatisfied with it. You just don't like it anymore. It's not the same. Or it's sort of like when you buy a car and then somebody dings your door. And I read an article one time where they said, if someone dings your door, you should get that ding out. Because that ding is the beginning of a lot of dings and you get less and less and less in love with your car. But if you get the ding out, you still have that sense of, oh, this is, this is my car, I like it. But there's a way in which life in itself begins to gradually move us towards a level of dissatisfaction. We just stop liking it. And what was once something that we really, really liked becomes this thing that we become less and less and less satisfied with. It's like instead of being in the experience, we shift into problem-solving mode and begin to try to fix it somehow. And I think one more, um, one more way is we begin to have this universal sense that whatever comes into my view or my purview belongs to me and it becomes mine. And in that sense of this is now mine, then any change or any uh, shift in it, it almost as if we get caught in trying to control it so that I can have mine, whatever is mine.
So then I, as I started practicing more and more and beginning to look at all these distortions and the way that I looked at everything that came into my life as to whether or not I uh, fell asleep and I just didn't notice things or I was stuck in some kind of problem solving, trying to fix it, or this expectation that things are, belong to me and their mind and I should uh, have some control over it. Gradually over time, I begin to realize that if I could see what I was holding on to, I mean, was I holding on to thinking that this was permanent? Or was I thinking or expecting this to satisfy? Or was I actually taking something personal that's not personal? When I started looking at the actual distortion in the nature of the way I was dealing with things, I could begin to see the actual distortion, meaning that in my practice, it was no longer about me trying to um, make things right. It was me trying to actually see the distortion. Whenever I had any kind of tension, I began to try to see where that tension was coming from, where the actual disconnect was. Because as as weird as it seems, we're not really trying to end suffering. If you think about it, if we live in samsara, and this idea of samsara predated the Buddha. So when the Buddha began his teachings, samsara and the idea of samsara already existed. Samsara is not some kind of we are going to be the generation that finally fixes it and gets everything right and smooth and steady. So this world that we're living in is a world of continuous suffering. And I begin to realize that if I work with the distortions, instead of trying to in the suffering, something began to flip, something began to change. And my relationship with life began to change. So in some respects, in every moment where there is any kind of tension, discomfort, some don't like, some resistance or pushing in that moment, you are in the presence of liberation. Because in that moment, you could unhook yourself from the distortion and shift yourself into reality. You could move from being in the continuity of the suffering itself and shift yourself into this continuity of mindfulness and begin to move with reality. And if we could move with reality, reality itself will bring us to the crest. This, we move, we are patient with the low spot of the wave and it moves us into the crest, and we can see where we are. We can see what to do. And all our tension and struggle and trying to fix everything, it subsides. We know exactly what to do. I mean, I cannot believe the knowing that comes with stillness is a very different kind of knowing. It's not the knowing that comes with problem solving, analyzing, figuring it out. It's not that kind of knowing. It's not the shoving and pushing kind of knowing that I can shove and push and make something happen. I mean, I lived as a prosecutor. I can shove and push and make what things happen all the time. But that's not the kind of knowing that 
rises to this level of Nibbana and liberative quality. And what I begin to realize is I had a misunderstanding in my practice. I lived in my practice as if I, if I could figure out how to get rid of the suffering, how to, you know, cessation of suffering. Let's get rid of the suffering. And then I would have it. That's what I thought the whole of the practice was about, was somehow or another figuring out how to end suffering. Because the third noble truth is the end of suffering. And when I started working on getting more clarity around the distorted way I was looking, sensing into the moment, now I begin to know something differently. And I begin to realize that suffering ends. That's it. I don't have to end it. It's going to end on its own. It's going to come back, but it's going to end on its own. I don't have to do nothing to make it go. And I don't have to try to prevent it from coming. That what I begin to see is that the only thing that was ever happening in my life was the arising of suffering and the cessation of suffering. That's all that was happening. Dukkha, the end of Dukkha. Dukkha, the end of Dukkha. Dukkha, the end of Dukkha. And when I stopped trying to end or get rid of suffering, me, I got to get rid of the suffering, It's sort of like riding the waves. You kind of just ride the waves, just as it is. I know it seems like no way we can ride these waves. No way. This is terrible times. What are you talking about? The world is coming to an end as we know it. It can't possibly be just a riding the waves, sort of like pleasant, unpleasant. But I'm telling you that the greater difficulty is this distorted way that we believe that we have to fix life and we have to make life what it should be. That in that making life what it should be, we are creating or trapped in a world of dukkha that we will never get out of, never. It is the nature of this world, this realm that we live in is made up of dukkha. So I want to leave you with this thought here. Do you have time for some questions here? If this realm that we live in as human beings, if it is of the nature to be full of suffering and there's no way anyone in this room is going to end it, it's of the nature to be suffering. You cannot end it. What exactly is our purpose being here? What is the purpose of being here? Have you considered this? Because I could see our purpose if our purpose is to come and make the world a better place. And we are failing at that. So if that's not our purpose, what do you think our purpose is? This is what I think Buddha's search was. And he realized that our perception of the world we live in is askew. It is 
distorted. And what if our whole purpose of being here is to come into right view of the world we live in and see it completely different, completely different. And what if that seeing in the world we live in is without suffering? I could never, if anyone had told me that it would be possible to live in the world that I live in and not be consumed by suffering, I would have told them they were crazy. I mean, I grew up in trauma, projects, you name it. I grew up in mess. I lived in mess my whole life. And yet, I do not live in that mess anymore. I do not live in it. I know it's difficult. I got to vote just like you got to vote. I got to live with the mess. I do tell my sons, I'm old, so... I'm going to be dead when things get crazy. But they have reminded me that I will come back again in the mess that's already there. So don't get too happy. <laughs> but my point that I'm making is I can see through my own practice that in the midst of this great difficulty, is an immense amount of happiness. There is so much joy and happiness all over the world, all over my life, all around me, all the time, that I do not live in the weight of samsara. That's the difference. I live in samsara, but I am not trapped in the weight of it. I. And I allow the trough, the wave itself, to bring me up to the crest. And I rest in the up and down of the world. Up and down, up and down, up and down. And I don't have this distortion that somehow or another, I should only be floating on the top. I live in the low parts. I live in the high parts and the low parts and the high parts. And it has gotten steadier, easier, softer, happier. I can be happy when it's low. I can be happy when it's high. It doesn't matter. So we're going to look at tomorrow all these. I have nine Um different ways that we can begin to look at our distortions, break up our distortions. And the more you break up the distortion, the less you're trapped in that closed loop. You get outside of it. And when you're outside of that closed loop, oh, it's a completely different world, completely different, because you no longer have to make sure everything is perfect. You're just riding the waves, just as they are. Let's just sit for a moment. I'm going to have Penny Harder, a poem by Penny Harder. She says it a little differently. She says, a revelation, the student in high school who didn't know how to tie her shoes. I took her into the book room, knowing what I needed to teach was perhaps more important than Shakespeare or grammar. I guided her hands through the looping and the pulling of the ends. After several tries, she got it, walked out the door, empowered. How many lessons are like that? Skills never mastered in childhood, simple tasks ignored, let go for years. This morning, my head bawled from chemotherapy. 
my feet further apart than they used to be as I bend to tie my own shoes. That student returns to teach me the meaning of life, to simply tie the laces and walk out. Simply tie the laces and walk out of myself into the sunny winter day. Wow, thank you so much for your kind attention. Let's see if there's any comments or got a couple of few minutes, about 10 minutes or so. See if anybody has any comments. And we'll use the mic in this room for anyone who wants to ask a question and on Zoom, uh, maybe raise your virtual hand. Thanks. That was that was a fun talk. Um, you know, you talk about walking in here, not noticing. You know, I I go through my life that like that, and I'm constantly, you know, life is kind of boring. I'm trying to entertain the mind, and so, you know, it seems to me my big problem is that I'm not interested. Yeah. There's there's better fish to be had over here, but I'm missing my life. And so uh, would you have any suggestions for how to bring more interest into the mundane aspects? Yeah. Uh, irritation. <laughs> tension. There's probably a lot of irritation, tension, things you don't like in your life. Get interested in that. In the things that are um so the things that are rubbing you the wrong way, because what I think when we get to that place in our life when we don't have any interest is because we smoothed out all the rough edges. And so basically there's no rough edges and we don't have anything in life that's actually allowing us to be in life. So you need to be up against life, which is the tension. That's why the, I, I believe that there's a reason why the Buddha said that the first ennobling truth is dukkha, there, the knowing of dukkha. And the minute you begin to know the presence of dukkha, the presence of some tension, some difficulty here, the minute you begin to know that, your whole capacity to 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 um, get interested and open in life is going to come from that. So dukkha, that's what you're looking for. That's what you want to see. You want to notice when you are, uh, or, or, or I had a monastic friend. I used to tell him, I don't know how you can practice when you, uh, he's like a wandering monk. And I said, I don't know how you practice when you don't have any, like, like you don't have a place to go, you don't have anywhere to live, how do you practice? And he said, um, with what I like and I don't like. So look for the things that you like and the things that you don't like. If you like something, consider it greed in the mind. It's greed, it's wanting, it's a preference, I like it. And you want to try to unhook yourself from that greed. If it's don't like, that's hatred in the mind. If you don't see greed nor hatred in the mind, that's delusion, because there's some kind of greed or hatred there. And that this, this is the whole of the practice, is learning to see that. If we don't see it, it's because we've smoothed out all the rough edges and we're living in this little vacuum container. But instead, 
that's where you want to you want to stir it up and you can stir it up by noticing what you like and what you don't like you could notice just your irritations when you get irritated just a little tiny irritation just a, it's just a little thing nothing to be made a big deal about but i think if you uncover that little you know little thing you uncover that <laughs> That's what ends up happening. Big, 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 huge things. You'll probably have too much interest. It'll be like, how do I turn him back down again? But that's what I think. I think look for the things where you're irritated and don't fix the problem. Don't fix it. Because if you fix it, you just smooth out the difficulty and you're back okay again. So don't fix it. Let it be there, low part. Don't get floundering in it. Don't drown. Just stay in the difficulty of it and see, let it be there. Let that irritation just be there and see what happens. Thank you. Yeah. Why? I hope you're quiet because you're deep in the trance of Dhamma. <laughs> like I'm so like here, I don't know, I can't say nothing. I've been in those moments, you know. Not like, oh my God, when are we going to get out of here? <laughs> There is a hand online also. We'll do this one and then we'll do the hand online. I just really appreciate your talk. And I just want to say that's the most fantastic answer to the question of interest, which is a question I think a lot of us have had or have heard. And I just love that answer that you just gave. That was really inspiring. <laughs> Good. It's like, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, get interested in it. I mean, yes. this is the nature of what I'm trying to point to. We clear out all the problems. That's what we do. We scrape off all the rough edges so everything is smooth because we have a distortion that if it's smooth and easy, there's not going to be any suffering. But we are in the realm of suffering. By its very nature, there's going to be suffering. And we keep smoothing it out, smoothing it out. And our box is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. That's the image that yeah. was coming, that shrinking of the box. Yep. It's wonderful. Great. I think Justin has his hand up. Hi. <clears throat> so I've worked, I've done this practice for quite a while. Um, one of the main things I run into is, um, you know, part of suffering is, I hear an echo. Hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, part of the problem that comes with suffering is kind of absorbing the energies of other people. Um, I, and, and that's a big part of suffering for me is relationships with other people. So how do you deal with like such strong energies from people when you don't want to have those attachments, but they just kind of come naturally? Do you kind of know what I'm saying? I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, if like you feel a very strong connection to somebody um and it's it's maybe some somebody that you know you it's such a strong connection that you can't quit thinking about you know that person but the conditions of that relationship you know aren't really in place to like form a, a, a relationship with that person so i mean it, it gets to be overwhelming sometimes um it so, does. so I guess what I'm going to say is 
the first thing you said was that you've been doing this practice a long time. So the I'm mean, I'm just gonna tell you as a practitioner, you are not trapped by other people. You are trapped by your own sort of craving or clinging to them being otherwise. You want them to be a certain way. And in that, you're clinging to this, the whole point of suffering, the whole point of our uh, difficulties comes from our own clinging. Buddha was very clear about this. There is no thing outside of us that will ever cause us any distress. The distress is coming from our own misperception of the moment, of the person, of the situation. And wanting it to be otherwise, taking it personal, the thing, the relationship isn't satisfying me as much as I wanted it to, or it doesn't work out the way I intended it to be. These are the distortions that we place on every relationship we have with someone. So as a practitioner, our job is not to expect, oh, I'm not gonna have any difficulty with people. Somehow or another, I'm going to rise above that and I'm just going to be okay with everybody. It's not really, that's not what it means to be a practitioner. The practitioner is sort of like the answer to the first question. Your practice is to unhook yourself from your judgments around that relationship. It is not to somehow fix the relationship or make the relationship somehow work out the way it, it and everybody's happy. No, it is to begin to see what you're craving or holding on to that doesn't exist in that relationship. So the way I helped myself begin to see that this is all about me. You know how you say, no, the relationship is bad. It's really me. It really is you. <laughs> this isn't really, it really is. So you almost have to think of it as every time you come into a difficulty in a relationship, this is your opportunity to practice unhooking yourself from the nature of this type of difficulty. So I have a sister that I never could get along with. And in that relationship, if I could have fixed my sister, I would not have had a problem. But she was unfixable. And she, she's my older sister, so she is not listening to me. It's not like I could say, do it this way, Deborah. She is not doing it. But when I begin to unhook myself from the, I use the tension of our relationship, me and her, I use that tension to unhook myself from my own clinging and craving it to be otherwise, that in the process of that, we get along. I mean, she's still the same person. She still drinks way too much. She still gets all in her way. But what doesn't happen is I don't get caught up in that like I used to because I unhooked myself from the tension of that. I let go of her being any other way than the way she is. She just... That's just Deborah. That's the way she is. And I'm good with that. I can't stay with her when she's drinking, but we flew all the way to London and had this huge 
fabulous vacation. My sister, I used to couldn't be in the same room with her for 20 minutes without cussing her out. We flew all the way to, I mean, we sat on an eight hour flight and did not cuss at each other one time. I had a great time with her. And it is not because she had to change. It's because I unhooked myself from clinging to her being someone other than she is. She is who she is. And when I, at night, when she would start drinking, I would get in my little bed and I would go to sleep. And she would say, are you going to stay up and talk to me? I'm like, I, I wish I could, but I'm so tired. Got to go to sleep. Yawning, play snoring. She goes, are you sleeping? I'm sleeping. Play snoring. <laughs> but she would leave me alone. And I left her alone. So the thing I'm pointing to is, truly, when you see this tension in relationships arising, as a practitioner, look to your own clinging. What are you holding on to? What are you expecting to be in that relationship? And it's not there. And see if you can find a way to unhook yourself from that tension. Make it less about them and more about you. Does that make sense? I'm telling you this this way with this kind of directness because you're a practitioner. And as a practitioner, you can do this. It is difficult, but you can do this. And you can free yourself from all of that tension that comes from relationship. You see what I'm pointing to? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, it's very difficult. And, um, you know, when you're in something like that, I mean, I have faith that I can do it, but, <laughs> you know, you, when you're in the thick of it. Um, yes, you can do it. Yeah. You can yeah. do it. Have faith in that because it is... I guarantee you, Justin, if you work on the unhooking yourself and you make that the main thrust of your dealing with the pain of the relationship, unhooking myself from this difficulty and letting it be, then any relationship ever that you have difficulty with, you will be able to let go of it. But if you have to fix this other person or make the situation better, then you will have to do that anytime you ever have any difficulty with anything. And you can't do that. So this learning to unhook becomes the gift that keeps on giving because you will learn to unhook all the time from anything. Do you just give yourself plenty of time, plenty of space? You're in the low part. And just trust that as you practice, every time you're sitting, images come up in your mind, ideas come in your mind, old stories come in your mind. See if you can sit there and notice, what am I holding on to? Am I wishing it was permanent and it's not permanent? Am I wishing it was going to satisfy something and it doesn't? Am I wishing that thinking that this is all about me, somehow it's connected to me and it's not? That's what you're looking for. The distortion that you're holding on to. And you should come tomorrow because we're going to talk about all kinds of distortions. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them. There's all kinds of ways that we distort reality. So anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's about 836. So we probably should end. Thank Yeah. Thank you all for being here with us. I appreciate you all. <laughs>